Uh, we went through the uh, so much All right, I think we're going to get started. Uh, everybody wants to settle down. Did everybody get food? Did everybody get food that wanted food? Okay, I think there's a few more burritos left in, in the basket in there. Uh, so welcome to the 110th Open Government Hack Night. Uh, we have some uh, really cool presentation tonight. Uh, Charlie and Doug are going to talk about the array of things. Uh, I won't I won't reveal too many details. I'll let them do that. Uh, but before we get to that, we're going to very quickly, if we can, go around the room and everyone just quickly introduce yourself and uh, maybe just like you know what you're interested in. Why why are you interested in open data? By the way, if you don't know what this is. This is the Open Gov Hack Night. We talk about <laughs> open data and civic innovation. So if you don't like any of those things, you should leave. Or I mean, or maybe you might like it, but then we'll see. Um, so uh, we'll go around and do introductions. Then we'll have a brief uh, open floor for announcements. If you guys have events or projects or anything Open Gov civic tech related, uh, sort of an open floor for that. Uh, and then we'll get to the presentation. Uh, and then after that. We uh, will sort of break out into groups and work on stuff. Um, this week, we actually are trying out something a little bit new. Uh, we had a group uh, meeting last week, a leadership council meeting, the first sort of democratic, like open, uh, you have ideas, you want to become part of this, uh, the leadership movement of this group, uh, you can. So one of the takeaways from that was this idea of topic facilitators. So we're going to have, I believe, five, four verticals. Huh? Oh, you wrote them up there already. Uh, we're going to have breakout groups focusing on a particular area. Uh, so we have transportation. Is Stephen Vance here? Oh, man. Did he ditch the very first? Does anybody want to be? Uh, he might be here later. He might be here later. OK. We'll leave that one up there. But transit uh, is one of them. Education, which I believe Josh will be leading his on us here. OK. So Josh will be leading that group. Environment, uh, Scott uh, Bezo right there. Uh, city data, Gene in the back. Uh, and then there's a civic hacking 101 slash orientation, which is Christopher. Um, we'll, uh, when we break out, we'll, before we break out, we'll, if anybody has any other ideas for breakout groups, you could sort of suggest those, and we can uh, sort of uh, um, run with those if, you, if, if people want to kind of coalesce around that idea. Um, so you have a little bit of time to think about a like, really good idea for a topic breakout group. Um, obviously, we chose like sort of very broad categories. They could be more narrow than that. Uh, it's really kind of up to you guys what you guys want to talk about. Um, so uh, I suppose without further ado, then, we will get to the introductions. I am Derek Eder. I am an open data web developer here in Chicago with Datamate. And I've been organizing this event for, I don't know, 110 time now. <laughs> uh, so uh, and I like building stuff with open data. Hi, my name is Christopher Whitaker. I'm a civic technology consultant for the Smart Code Collaborative and Code for America, and I'm also one of the organizers. Uh, let's go with this uh, I'm Greg. I'm a, I serve as a developer evangelist uh, with Twilio. Uh, I lived in Chicago for nine years and just absolutely love it. And this is the best intersection of <coughs> Chicago and technology that happens every week. My name is Matt. Uh, I'm a recent Dev Bootcamp grad. Uh, just kind of here just checking it out. It's my first time doing. Uh, the Gov Hack Night. Uh, my name's Lauren. I'm a statistical consultant, and I really want to get involved in data, so I'm here. Hey, I'm Rafi. Uh, I'm a bio major, so I'm kind of out of my field here, but I'm just here to learn more about how technology affects the community. Scott, I'm a academic at Western Michigan University, urban planner, uh, who's interested in big data and smart cities. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm a recent computer science graduate, and uh, I heard about this, and it looked interesting, so I decided to come. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm a network analyst, and uh, interested in big data and pretty much everything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's Narayan. I uh, build large systems for data analysis. My name's Scott. I work at Argo National Lab, and I work on cloud systems. I'm Angela. I run Collection Space. We're an open source uh, initiative for museums with museum data. My name is Gage, I'm applying to an open source project on the like this in the farmers. So, kind of looking at what's the data can give you. Can I... 
Yes, make us go. I'm Danny. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Chicago, um, and I'm interested in sustainability um, metrics and planning and how to integrate data into policy. Hey, I'm Varun Goyal. I'm a software developer. I created a app with Varavil for Shriek Media in Chicago. I'm just here to learn more about the data. Hi, my name is Gaurav, so I'm an application developer and I long for the best content map. This was your name. I'm David, I'm a software engineer here in Chicago, and um, I'm interested in what I can do with data and where I can find free data. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Claire, and in a week I'll be an interaction designer at the University of Chicago. I'm Elizabeth, and I'm a project manager in a creative agency here, and I'm interested in education. Um, my name is Sabi. I mostly work in supply chain analytics, and uh, I also work in environmental issues. Uh, I'm Scott. Uh, I'm a software developer interested in uh, environmental issues, especially uh, Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm Nina. I do digital things and data things with Illinois Health Matters, which is an Obamacare facilitating group. And since there's a museum person and a, and a bio person here tonight, I will confess that I have a whole other hat, which is I study spiders in the field museum. <laughs> and <laughs> ne next, next week, I won't be able to be here because I will be live tweeting the American Arachnological Society. <laughs> <laughs> You will be tweeting the stuff that gives me the EBGBs. Yeah. <laughs> tweeting the stuff that gives me the EBGBs. Oh, no, that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, my name is Ari. I am also a, a software engineer here in Chicago. Uh, I heard about this from a coworker, and it sounded really cool. So that's my first one. Let me check it out. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm a software developer. I uh, work with Ari here. And we both decided to come see what it's all about. My name is Sarah. I'm a community organizer with a group called the Young Invincibles. I'm interested in civic innovation and public policy. My name is also Ari. I'm a civically minded photographer and multimedia artist. Uh, I'm Gino. I uh, was a civil engineer for two and a half years, and I'm interested in transportation and trying to advance the adoption of electric vehicles in Chicago. Uh, my name is Dale Brown. I'm an electronics engineer, just uh, running my horizons. Um, my name is Ryan. I work for the Forest Preserves of Cook County, and I'm their first ever web person. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Jen. Um, I'm an accounting major, actually. Um, I'm just here to meet some really cool people that are doing awesome things. Good job, guys. <laughs> uh, my name is Paul. I work in software integrations. Uh, I'm interested in open data public policy. I'm Noam. I'm a sysadmin interested in the backbone of the Chicago City Council. Stephen from IDM, and I'm interested in open data for several years. I'm Hui. I'm with the Metropolitan Planning Council, exploring the role of urban planning and technology. Uh, I'm Josh. I'm interested in education data, uh, and I also help manage Cook County's open data portal. I'm Rob Drinkwater, teaches the School of the Art Institute, and just a part of the beat to take it. I'm Nick. I'm a map maker, and I come here to get more things from the map. <laughs> 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 I'm Rafi, uh, I'm a web designer, and I just want to come see what this is about. It's really interesting. I'm Paul from uh, WebEx and Chicago Node, the Open Data Institute, and founder of Open Data Institute in 2000 Open Data for many, many years. I'm here to learn about uh, working on a transportation project. I want to learn more about uh, different types of stuff to ensure measuring more people in a CPA partner. Uh, I'm Forrest Gregg, I'm a partner in database and a PhD in sociology and research I'm Gene Linus, I'm a data scientist at the city of Chicago. And can I say a little bit about the uh, track later? Uh, do it during the announcements. Okay. And I will say more about my <laughs> during the announcements. Uh, I'm Maria, I'm a research professional at the University of Chicago. I'm interested in sustainable development. 
I'm Jessica. I work with health data now, but I don't know if you're going to be the education or the education. I'm John, I'm student with Harris School for Public Policy and I'm Daniel, I'm with the City of Chicago and I'm on a team that's going to be presenting a few weeks on social services, so I'm here to uh, check out how this all works. I'm Mel and I'm a Microsoft Civic Engagement Fellow. I'm Kathy and I have a very small amount of experience with big data, but I've heard about the this guy and it's seemed interesting. I'm Rob Carroll. I'm a demographic consultant for foundations and not for profits. Hi, uh, John Levy, uh, Open Data Program Manager with the city. Um, <coughs> so I'm also happy to help out with the city data when we get to that. Anybody else back there? Yeah. Uh, I'm Logan with the City Computer Science and I'm the city with the I'm the city of Chicago, and I'm interested in making education accessible to everyone. I'm Larry, I'm a business and treasures washing time, I'm interested in the community. I'm Nick I work at Mathematica Policy Research, uh, doing program and evaluation, and I'm interested in um, open data and system innovation. I'm Richard, I'm a developer at Networks. <laughs> I'm Sarah, I'm an American Center, and I'm interested in the way to do it. I'm Amitabh, I teach uh, data analysis at University of Chicago. I'm interested in measuring corruption using process. Mm -hmm. I'm Linda, I'm founder of the Honorary Chicago, I'm mapping the Chicago's uh, honorary streets and different uh, honors given out by the city of Chicago. I'm Chad Griffin. I'm an artist and designer. Uh, my first time. I come to see what's going on. I'm John. I'm a software engineer. I've uh, been on the mailing list for a little while, so I'm excited to finally make it out to one of these and see what it's all about. Uh, I'm Corey. I'm a software engineer. I'm, it's cool because uh, it sounds like you're making Chicago more of a computer, so that seems nice. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas Pampas, uh, professor of architecture at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, presenting on the Array of Things project tonight with this guy. Uh, Charlie Catholic, also presenting, and I have files for Doug and I on slides. If and when we can plug in. Yeah, cool. Awesome. We'll awesome. Yeah, we'll do the announcements first and then we'll get to it. Um, so, uh, awesome group. Thanks to everybody for coming. As you can tell, uh, a very diverse group, a lot of backgrounds, uh, which is, I think, one of this uh, one of this group's strengths. So, always always awesome to hear about all the cool things everyone does. Um, moving on, announcements. If anybody has them, like I mentioned, uh, events or uh, newsworthy items, uh, anything open government or tech related, that you want to share with the group, Mr. Rufo. Yes. So, uh, the Center for Neighborhood Technology next week will be doing a hackathon. Uh, starts here on Tuesday, uh, people forming groups, and then next weekend and Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, for those that aren't aware, the Center for Neighborhood Technology is a uh, sustainable city think and do tank, I think is what they call themselves. Um, and it'll be all about how there it is the Urban Sustainability Apps Competition, all about uh, just this uh, making uh, civic apps, but uh, in contest. There's a lot of great prizes, uh, great judges, including uh, Harper Reed from uh, Obama, uh, Obama for America. And uh, yeah, you should check it out. Next week, here on Tuesday, and then uh, over the weekend at uh, Tech Nexus. Cool. Other announcements? Do I, get, do I get to announce now? Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm a data scientist with the city of Chicago, and I'll be doing one of the um, what do, you, what do we call them? The, breakout uh, sessions. The breakout yeah. sessions. So if there's anything that you're interested in, I'm pretty new, but uh, Jonathan will be, I guess, with me, and um, and uh, he's not as new. And so if, there's, <laughs> if there are things that you want to know about the city, please, or about city data, please come talk to me, and uh, I'd be interested in finding out, you know, what you want to find out and uh, telling you what I know and uh, collaborating. But most importantly, if there's anybody that's interested in anything related to vacant properties or community development or 
the data surrounding vacant properties. I don't have anything to announce, but this is probably something we're going to be working on, and I'd love to hear from anybody that's uh, an expert in that or interested in that or uh, or anything that has to do with vacant properties. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I'm Maria Chicago, I'm down as uh, new maps, and so I'm going to be offering uh, free tours starting this weekend, walking tours, uh, uh, most likely Michigan Avenue and um, possibly State Street, but uh, stay tuned to uh, Twitter, uh, Honorary Chicago, at Honorary Chicago. What's and the tour going to be about? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's um, a map that I've uh, built with the help of this group is uh, the honorary, those brown street signs that you see everywhere, who they are, where they are, and why, uh, why they exist. So I'm uh, putting together a series of uh, walking tours and trying out some, some new, uh, new material. So um, yeah, I'd be interested in anyone who wants to join and any feedback. Yeah. So if you want a full-time job, track me down after. <laughs> You'll just abuse us of the notion. <laughs> you like to you have to find out. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I I have two things actually. Uh, one one thing is that um, the folks who have been working to enroll people in Obamacare are having a conference in DC, and it's if you want to pull it up, it's stateofenrollment.org, um, all one word. <laughs> and one of the people who spoke today was uh, Paul Smith, who was one of the leaders of the ad hoc group that actually repaired healthcare.gov. And um, you, you, can't, you can't see his talk right now, but it'll be archived and posted after the conference ends in a couple of days. Um, if you're interested in procurement or in um, making things work or in uh, policy people working together with technical people. Uh, this is something that um, I thought was remarkably moving and, and hopeful for all those things that we care about. So, and there are lots of other data things we can add to this conference, but that was something that was just a, 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 a big highlight for me. Um, on other fronts, this is kind of late in the game, but apparently our president, Barack Obama, today announced that tomorrow is the first national day of making things. So presidential proclamation, you know, if you search for it at, on the press releases and whatever, it's up there. So if you want to like not go into work and say that I just have to stay home and make <laughs> <laughs> Unlike my day job, right? I'm going to make something. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, I had one I wanted to share with uh, the group. This is something that uh, DataMate worked on with the DePaul Institute for Housing Studies. This is a parcel uh, resolution map of Cook County, and it is each building is highlighted by the uh, housing stock composition. So we have single family homes in sort of this lighter yellow, uh, condominiums in sort of a darker orange, gold, and then two to four unit buildings, five to 49, 50 plus. Um, and so you can kind of browse around sort of for the first time in very high detail uh, all the housing stock compositions for different neighborhoods in Chicago. And as you can imagine, it varies quite a bit actually based on where you are in the city. Uh, if you actually zoom out a little bit, Christopher, um, you can obviously tell uh, in the suburbs there's obviously a lot less density as you go further out, uh, and then there's certain neighborhoods, uh, and a lot of this has to do with the age of the buildings and when these neighborhoods were sort of first built out. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, two to four unit buildings in my neighborhood, in Logan Square, and then also in like the West Loop, that's where a lot of the condominiums are getting built. So it's really cool for the first time you can see this, uh, see this data. So feel free to browse around with that. Uh, any other announcements? Cool. Well, then I suppose without further ado, then uh, we will get to Charlie and Doug. By the way, there are will be three chairs up in the front for those of you who want to sit up here, uh, uh, and not stand in the back. Um, Oh, and there's one up here, too. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll leave it, uh, I'll leave it up to you guys. Yeah, his first. And then more. Uh, I have pulled up right now. All right, I'll give you the key.
We're going to try to do this in 15 minutes or less so that there's more time for interaction. So we'll talk really fast because I'm standing. I'm going to stand. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can actually give a talk in that short amount of time, much less half that amount of time. So we'll do our best. Um, so this is who we are. I work at Argonne New Chicago. Um, I've been working on the internet for a long time, and um, I like to play drums. And Doug, as you can see, always wears really cool hats. So we got together, the two of us and some other folks, Rob Drinkwater, who's also from School of the Art Institute of Chicago, lots of folks from Argonne, New Chicago, um, starting about four years ago to ask ourselves the question if there were interesting things that we could do uh, together across these disciplines that we wouldn't be able to accomplish on our own. And that eventually brought us to thinking of things related to the city. So we're going to talk about a project that we have been talking with the city of Chicago about now for about two years um, based on doing lots of workshops and urban sensing and wearable sensors and other things and finding that building gadgets to do sensing is a pretty easy thing to do, but finding a place in a major city like Chicago to place sensors is a really hard thing to do. So we went to the city and said, can we do the hard thing once for lots of different projects and get uh, hit the three things that you need to do urban sensing besides the sensors, which are places to put them that they won't be uh, hurt by the elements or curious hands or baseball bats, to a continuous power so you don't always have to swap out batteries, and three, <coughs> internet access. So they liked the idea, it became part of this strategic tech plan, uh, and we wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation. We haven't heard back yet, but we're moving forward, and I'll tell you what that looks like. So first of all, why we're doing this, I mentioned some of the motivation, but there are things that um, our scientific colleagues at universities and labs don't understand about cities. They try to model cities, but we haven't ever measured certain attributes of cities. Simple things like measuring how the air flows through urban canyons. We can model that, but we have never really measured it to see if the model is reproducing what happens in real life. Other things here. and. Another thing that we wanted to do was to enable not just university research, but commercial research as well in an environment that's not available as far as we know anywhere else where you can say, OK, I have 100 sensors. I want to spread them around a downtown area. Uh, can you install them for me sometime in the next few months so I can try this experiment? Or I just need a Linux box on every corner in the downtown area with the Bluetooth antenna. <laughs> that's not something that most cities offer. Sure, asking yourself that question. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sure half the people in here have thought about doing that. Um, so we think of it as sort of like this breadboard for the city where we have the ability to inject technology right down into the built infrastructure. Um, and what we're hoping is that um, by putting something like that out there, it will cause people to think of things that they might not have thought of if they didn't think about the possibility of a Linux device with a Bluetooth antenna on every corner or something like that. OK, so that's why. What is it? Um, it sort of depends on your point of view. Um, Douglas will talk about what we've, uh, you know, what we've been thinking in terms of what it looks like and, and how people perceive it and interact with it. Uh, at Argonne in New Chicago, we've been working on what the guts of it look like and sort of the technology of the thing. It's got a, a control system. That's a Linux device. It's got sensor hosting devices. It's got um, provisionable Linux devices in it. Um, uh, somebody, as I was walking in, said, oh, you brought one with you. And I corrected him and said, no, I brought it with us. So this is like serial number one. Um, it's got five different microprocessors in it that we're trying to test it out to see if when you do this and put it up in the sun, if they will survive. Um, so that, that's you know part of what it is. It's this really kind of 3D puzzle slash computer engineering project. And then for most people in the room, maybe the way you want to think about the, inter, uh, the array of things is it's this really big bucket of data that will continue to, to grow over time. Uh, I should also mention the array of things uh, came out of this kind of thinking about the Internet of Things, uh, which is one of the buzzwords or phrases that I try to avoid the others being smart city and big data. Um, <laughs> and, and we were proposing this to the National Science Foundation as part of a 
solicitation for major research instrumentation. So we thought instrument, it's an array. It's an urban instrument, so it's the array of things. So that's where that name came from. Um, and uh, so, so this is what, what we're doing. Um, this is who's involved. Um, several companies uh, here, and then uh, since we drew this slide, we've had uh, Motorola Solutions and Qualcomm offer to uh, get involved and provide engineering and give us gadgets to put out there. We have been working with scientists at all these different places on different things, and so when we started talking about big sensors in the city, they just came out of the woodwork and said, oh, can we do this experiment or that experiment? So we just had this, you know, 13 universities or so and all these different science groups that said, you know, could you put like precipitation on at least some of these devices or wind speed or, or motion or something like that. So that's who's involved. Um, the, the sort of where and the when, what we're hoping and shooting for is by the end of September, uh, before we hear about this NSF project that would allow us to buy, this is what 800 of them would do. We think with the money that we asked NSF for, we could actually get to that scale. Maybe not in these exact places. This is sort of notional. Um, but while we're waiting for NSF to make up their mind, Argonne provided some money for us to build about 30 of the units. Um, 30 that will be something like that. And then Doug will say more about what they look like. And at the very least, we want to start with uh, up and down Michigan Avenue here, because there's an Internet of Things conference happening here in October. And they're going to do this walking route with uh, Chicago Architecture Foundation uh, folks helping them on that route. So we want to put these out there and see if we can have some sort of demonstration applications. So that's the who, what, where, when, uh, how. Uh, and Doug is going to talk a little bit about uh, some other aspects of the project. And then we'll sort of come back. And if you haven't figured it out by now, we'll, we'll propose some reasons why we came here to talk to you about it. So I'll talk a little bit more about the thing in the array of things. So it, it's not only a platform for urban science. Science is primarily a platform for urban science, this system. Um, but it's also an infrastructure. It's a physical infrastructure in the city. Uh, most infrastructural elements in the city are, are meant to be neutral. They're not meant to be seen. They're meant to be useful. They're meant to be used. But they're not necessarily something or an instance of, a, um, of something that's meant to be specifically interacted with. So. Yeah. Okay, so um, cities are getting bigger. You know, we, it took us 100 years to develop cities that were over 10 million people. Now we have over 30 of those. Mm -hmm. Tokyo, the first city over 30 million people, is now one of many. So cities are getting bigger, but their footprints ought to not get bigger. So I think that we're going to have to deal with a different kind of choreography of people in built space. And so that necessitates a kind of an infrastructure that is maybe a little bit more resilient and can adapt to conditions. Hence the array of things. Next, please. So, you know, this is the infrastructure that we have. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's the infrastructure that we have now. The um, inadequacy of the Chicago infrastructure for delivering the utilities that we need every day is is well known. Lots of parts out there, but those parts aren't necessarily coordinated with one another. It's difficult to optimize. It's difficult to have one system delivering one element of physical life in the city communicating with another. And so the array of things is a foray into that kind of more resilient infrastructure. Next, please. Thank you. So as Charlie mentioned, um, we kind of pitched this idea to be included in the city's technology plan, and it was accepted. So the city of Chicago is a partner with us in this project, which is really interesting. And so, can go on, please. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, in architecture and design, we've been using kind of digital modeling tools to make parametric iterations for a long time, meet a long time now, meaning that we can kind of cycle through a variety of forms and a variety of shapes and materials to solve problems. But we want to see this project really soup to nuts as a parametric project being that conditions of the project can be affected by and can be changed by what we learn about the system as we deploy it. So if we're going to deploy it in states, we don't necessarily have to deploy one thing never to be changed again. In fact, the technology that we put in the node is probably going to be obsolete in a few years anyway, so we're going to have to go in there and change the technology to kind of do the kinds of uh, experiments that we want to do in the future. But 
Um, so, you know, uh, different conditions in different places where, where we uh, uh, deploy the nodes might cause it might um, cause us to develop a different kind of node. There's, it's not necessary that each uh, uh, node element look exactly like or perform exactly like any other. Um, for example, if the system is collecting information about uh, air quality in, in a neighborhood, <coughs> right, that data could be used to um, control and message people about the quality of air quality, the air quality in, in their neighborhood. There might be a condition that is worth sensing in another place that is more useful than air quality. It could be about ground temperature to see if ice is forming. It could be about um, the uh, the amount of people walking on the street, thus providing a um, kind of safe passage if you're walking at night. Next, please. So, kind of the openness of the design parameters have been wrapped into the form itself. Um, the 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 node is, consists of a ruggedized, weatherized box that we have all of the electronic elements in. And then around that is a layer of material that is kind of customizable per location and per performance. So there are elements of the, of the wrap that goes around the, the node that are, that are changeable. The size of the wrap, the material, a kind of perforation, different ways of, of emitting light and controlling the emittance of light. Um, and uh, the idea is to kind of open up these parameters and connect with people in participatory design events between now and the full uh, kind of, uh, unrolling and deployment of the project so that each node installation is customized per neighborhood and per condition. It's really important that um, this whole system be seen not only as a platform for urban science but also community technology. If uh, the, if this system gets misunderstood as another form of urban surveillance, we're in big trouble. So we can fix the technical aspects, we can fix the hardware and the software, but if we lose trust as we enroll this thing, then we're dead. We'll never be able to kind of reconstruct that, that trust. The system is really about ambient conditions in the environment. Temperature, humidity, light, sound. Um, there's no camera, uh, there's no microphone, there might be a microphone later for kind of detecting sound gain, <laughs> but the idea is not to uh, um, warehouse information that is identifiable, identifiable to any particular person, although particular people, uh, when open data kind of making communities use the data to make apps and tools, um, uh, you know, for people in neighborhoods, might see some value in the project. And also, uh, because the node is positioned in, in space and it knows where it is, um, we think that it could be a platform for delivering location-based services without necessarily having a user give away your identity and your location to the cloud to receive those services because the node knows where it is. Next, please. So this is the kind of the diagrammatic description of the of the the um, enclosure elements of the of the project. Customized wrap, LED lights, hardened enclosure, sensor pack, all of this positioned on uh, street lamps. So I don't know if it was clear, but the main armature for these nodes are city street lights, illumination lights, traffic poles, things like that. Um, most of them have power being provided 24 by 7. They already have kind of a, a ubiquitous exposure in the city. So pretty much wherever you go, there's a, there's a street light or there's a traffic signal. So we've got a ready-made kind of grid to work with. Next, please. Almost done. So there's an instance of a prototype of uh, the node on uh, being exhibited at the, the City of Big Data exhibition over at the Chicago Architecture Foundation. So you can go check it out. And you can kind of see a scale model of what this thing is going to look like as we begin to roll it out. Next, please. <coughs> Here's your deployment. Let's have this thing um, exist all over the city. More. So this is kind of like the ethic, right? <laughs> <laughs> the motto of the project. As much as we can, we want the full um, deployment of the system to be um, the opportunity for people to talk to the city and the city to listen. And also for the city to tell you something about its activity. Um, uh, so that all that information can get folded back into the deployment of the system. One more? I think that might be it. Oh yeah. 
through participatory design workshops like this. And I think we're, we're almost done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. So that's our project team. So if you didn't um, pick it up already, and we are, um, so WBEZ did a blog post after interviewing Douglas and I, um, where we talked a lot about uh, building privacy into the infrastructure. And this thing about trust is transparency is great if people trust that you're actually being transparent because they don't really have a way to validate that you're being transparent. So um, that's that's really sort of uh, at the foundation of the project. And based on, uh, so I, I have sensors on my sump pump and furnace and water heater, like I'm censoring out my whole house, all the windows and doors <laughs> and stuff. But I am, am like really, I would describe myself as radically anti-surveillance. So this is meant to be um, the polar opposite of a deployed surveillance system in a city, but something that's sort of owned by by the uh, by the people who live in the city. So we wanted to talk to you for these reasons, among others. It's uh, fairly straightforward to send the data to lots of different places. I happen to send my. You want to see how my sump pump is doing? It's at thingspeak.com. Um, <laughs> it's not. That's a site that's nice if you want to see a graph, but it's not very good as, as far as you know an app interface so that you can do a mobile device uh, application. So, um, you know, question number one is where would be the most useful place, assuming that people want to use this data in the way that you're doing, here's the data here. I mean, is this enough to just send it there? Uh, are there other places we ought to be sending it that have maybe better APIs for what you guys want to do? Um, we're at a point now, as I said, that's like unit number one there. It's really just sort of an experimental unit. Um, so we can change or add sensors. And we've not done an exhaustive search, but a fairly comprehensive search over several years of what can we can or can't put in there. The idea behind this is that that box won't change over the years, but the electronics inside will probably be totally different five years from now. So the city agreed to mount these things in the context of 500 of them, to mount them, to power them at no cost to the project, and to let us have access to them like once a year to swap things out. So it's a real partnership with uh, with DoIt and also uh, CDOT, who the electricians work for. Um, you know, thinking about other things that we could imagine doing, um, and then you know, this is really important to us. Douglas taught a class last fall to where that design came from, and we asked design students to think in terms of uh, several design requirements. One, that the systems be conspicuous and not these like hidden olive drab things. Two, that they be uh, playful and friendly looking, like a, like inviting looking. And three, that there would be multiple ways to interact with them, either mediated by a mobile device or even um, by your voice. So, so we're hoping to mount these about seven feet off the ground and put an accelerometer on the inside of that enclosure so that if you tap it, the whole thing is a button. So um, anyway, so that's why we're here. And I guess questions. Yes. Um, so are these nodes, is that the right term for them? Yes. Um, are these nodes going to be open source in the sense that I can go online or somewhere, find information about it, and build an exact replica of, of it yes, myself? Yes, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in fact, we're starting with like you know prototype grade electronic microcontrollers because there's already a big you know user group out there using Arduino's or Raspberry Pi's. Um, they kind of understand the API, they understand how to program it. Um, it's better for us to kind of use those systems and not proprietary systems that I've already made it hard hardened for the, the elements. We'll sacrifice so, that. So everything about it will be open source, even the parameter based design on the outside. Yeah. So you can, you know, the software, the hardware, everything. With one exception, class of exception, which is if you decide, like, you want to start a company because you have a really cool idea, maybe like for a you know, petahertz network. Uh, thing that, that doesn't require you know anything but solar power with one hour of sun. And right. You don't really want that to be open sourced. You might decide you want to create a company that would bring jobs to Chicago. So there will be a way for people to do proprietary work, but it has to be disclosed to somebody. Um, so there'll be sort of an oversight group that will include Brenna Berman, who's the CI for the city, uh, several of us, and some people not involved in the project as well. So so we want to try to build in 
accountability, transparency, and stuff like that. But if you want to replicate it, yes, we'll, um, we're already talking to several other cities who are interested. Yes, in the back. I was just curious if you were thinking about how it's going to communicate out. I know you already said that, but like, like, uh, like multicolored lights or something. Yeah. Like, like, will it like let it know? Will it, will it uh, show you its mood or something? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really good question. I mean, um, you know, with no kind of introductory didactic material, yeah. it would be easy to not understand what this light emitting thing is actually telling you, right? So that's. It is a design consideration. To what degree mm -hmm. can we have the thing be really pretty simple? We didn't want to outfit the node with an LCD sign or an LED sign because eventually that would be co-opted by advertising, right? Or co-opted in a way that we didn't want. Well, so we're there's like about a, the temperature thing downtown where you know when the barometer is falling, it's one yeah. color, and when it's rising, right. it's a different color. Yeah. You know, it could be interesting with like you know air quality or something. Absolutely. Uh, so the the link to design is how we allow people to understand that because they're all flashing pink now, it yeah. means that you know air quality has changed. Or if they're all flashing amber, there's an amber alert, and you maybe should kind of like check other interfaces to understand what's going on there. Uh, are you picking? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is each node gonna dump its data directly up to the cloud, or is there some kind of like what's the number? Uh, for sure. If we'll go here, we'd like to do it every 15 seconds. We'll figure out if that's feasible. Um, is there like, sorry to interrupt, is there like a mill, middleman type computer that collects everything from all the nodes and then talks to wherever it's going? Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a Linux device inside the box, this guy right here, that will talk to, the, to, the, to things like Arduinos, whatever we end up choosing, um, and we'll sort of collect the sensor data over time, and then periodically chirp it up to the cloud. If you want to say the cloud, so here and at least one place over here. And where is that central collection repository? So let's think of it this way. The inside this thing is buffering up data to burst it to this and multiple other things. So we'll for sure live here for as long as this exists. Um, and if there's another group that wants to take the data and do something else with it, it's open data. So they can suck it off and you know put it somewhere else. Yes? I think you mentioned something about um, some component of it being provisionable. Can you say a little bit more about that? This is something that we, we want to do, not in this version here, but the reason for all the Linux devices is you want to have a, a device that controls the sensors or that collects data from the sensors, but we also want to have at least two or three other Linux devices that are there that have access to the sensors and as well as to the antennas. And then, um, you know, we do this at Argonne, for example, we run national and international instruments, and you put a proposal in that says, I'd like to use your supercomputer, I need this many processors and this much time on the machine. And that gets peer reviewed, and then you get allocated the time if it's you know, scientifically, um, if it reviews well. So we have a similar idea here where you might decide you want to do something with 100 or 200 Linux devices on street corners, and you need access to the Bluetooth antenna and something else. Then we would have a way to give you those machines for a period of time for you to do your development and, and, your, and your deployment. That's where it kind of gets tricky with trying to maintain the system as you know stable and also uh, as as uh, respecting the privacy and that we'll be looking at the code that people are putting out there and we'll have agreements about what they can and can't do. I think that's an interesting part of the project because I think we feel like we have a responsibility to make sure that as community technology that we build the framework to allow people to propose other kinds of data collection um, experiments or you know activities that would be useful for them. So for example, if you live on the northwest side like I do and you're getting really tired of all the plates coming into O'Hare after the O'Hare modernization, runway modernization plan, um, you might want to collect information about the change in uh, sound and sound gain and the change in particulate matter falling down on you because of jet fuel. Um, that kind of information might not be as useful for people living on the south side where there might be you know, a coal burning energy producing plant happening. Right? 
And so, you know, the city is complex. The topography is uneven, both in terms of data and physical topography. So um, I think that it has to be provisionable in a lot of different ways. And so we're spending a lot of time trying to create the framework for connecting with um, community through participatory design events and other events the best, the best way we can as we have our uh, Just on the question back to the you can see that, yeah, um, I, I feel like framing it in terms of um, something that the, you know, the community could be part of is a big part of not freaking people out. Um, for example, I mean, he was mentioning about lights, like pollen, as you can tell. It's, yeah. like, it's very bad in the neighborhood where I'm in right now, um, like kind of on the north side. So I feel like, you know, having it be this participatory event and, you know, because people right now are so looking to jump on anything that's like, oh, this is surveillance, this is surveillance. Yeah. Just kind of from the start being like Because most of the time it is. Yeah, because yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And and just from the start being like, this is a very open project, like we want to you know, kind of accept whatever community yeah. ideas there are. I feel like that's a really good step to be taking. I mean if you're a neighborhood then you could advocate for the for like the delivery of city service to your neighborhood because the information that is available to you um, that you could create via this data, that would be fantastic. So the city has been you know, removing ash trees by the 10,000 every year because of the emerald ash borer data, right? Eventually, that's going to have an effect on um, uh, the remediation of our particulate matter in the air and also urban heat island effect, right? So if the city has removed more trees in your neighborhood, you should know. and You should be able to advocate with data for policy change or delivery of service in a way that it really makes sense for you. In fact, that's a really provocative part of the project for me is that because we're partnering with the city, um, well, I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so you're kind of talking about politics here. What is the, what is the governance structure going to be? I mean, is there an IRB? Is there going to be, I mean, I, uh, what kind of a, I mean, I know you guys and I like you guys, but like, what's the, what, <laughs> you guys move on? Yeah, I mean, like, how, like, what is, are you, what, how are these decisions going to be made about? Uh, these kind of subversive ideas. So there'll be, we don't have the, I don't, I can't draw you an org chart and tell you all the things that are going to be, but we're talking uh, with Brenna about an oversight that would look at all the experiments that are being done from the point of view of the general public. That will be a group that will, as I said, have Brenna, some of us from the project, and then people from the community. Obviously, you know, we have to choose people to be on a, a board like that. Um, from the point of view of technical decisions, there will be a small group of us who are actually already involved in making these technical decisions. Um, a lot of the technical decisions and even the placement will also be influenced by the science that we're trying to enable. <laughs> so we 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 put together four different science teams led by faculty at four different institutions. Uh, one in the physical sciences and, and life sciences, one in engineering, uh, one in social sciences, education, healthcare, and uh, uh, fourth in computer science. So, um, and then where you have a, a process that approves or doesn't approve experiments, that's something that I've been personally involved in for a long time, several decades, and so you sort of know how to do that. Um, but you, you know, you're, you're you're right to ask that question because that's part of transparency and until that sort of out there, well, it's an open question how this is going to work. Now we make a public commitment to here's the thing and all that stuff. Right. Um, I, I don't want to, so. Yeah, you, uh, so uh, we'll, I'll, maybe I'll, we'll one more question and then, um, and then we can proceed to the breakouts. Um, we can do it like those uh, t-shirt cannons. Who wants to ask? <laughs> This guy here. Yeah. Um, just back to the provisioning really quick, because what you were talking about as far as governance, is there is there a reason that it's not more like, say, the Weather Underground Network, where the devices are individually addressable, and therefore the provisioning, I'm, I'm curious about that, because it sounds like the provisioning will enable functionality that isn't normally there, say, through the API. And if it always was, and you could pull the machines, A, that would seem to aid transparency, and B, it would seem to allow multiple people to do research simultaneously. Is there a reason why uh, you're restricting? Let me sort of, uh, I think we may be talking about two different things. Okay. So with Weather Underground, if you want to write software to run on that node, right. 
are you are you saying that if I have a weather underground node that it's open for you to replace the software on it with what well, you want? That to that's the question. What what are does the software you're putting on the node not do that other scientists would? And if there's abilities that are there that you're not opening up to the people that it can do, but you're not giving them, the question is why. Meaning, if I've got a weather underground node, its job is to gather the weather. So what weather data is it not gathering that it can gather that someone would have to rewrite the code for? If you to design the system properly, you think wouldn't have to right? It's a Linux machine. Mm -hmm. It's got capabilities. It's got it's got the ability to do stuff that I can't even imagine, right? I mean, it's a it's a Linux machine. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> right. But, but it's only a set of sensors. You've designed right. the sensor you send to it. I mean, yeah, so it becomes a separate from computer. these provisional Linux machines. Right. Uh, is another machine that controls sensors and places that data where these guys can get to. Uh, we've decided that for various reasons, or we will decide for various reasons, including bandwidth, uh, uh, bandwidth preservation and transaction costs at the server, that we're going to report data at a certain rate. Um, we can't report you know, every 10 milliseconds. It's a choice that somebody has to make. The reason that we're having provisional devices on there is so that people who have ideas that we didn't think of can implement those ideas on the platform. So it's not about withholding capabilities. It's, it's actually about giving capabilities. It's, it's about giving a generative system to the community. One, you know, one of the decisions about uh, sensor data, for example, is we're reporting, let's say, every 15 seconds. Well, you might be interested in watching how Bluetooth devices are moving around. Not whose device or what the address is, but just watching how fast the Bluetooth devices are moving around an intersection. Well, it's not that we didn't think of that. It just wasn't something that we thought was going to add value to the 16 science groups that we were talking to. But if that's something that's important to your research, then we want to let you be able to do that. So. I, I, I'm sort of puzzled by the withholding comment. Is it, well, but is in, in the case that was just brought up as far as governance, if somebody could provision the machine, why wouldn't they be able to gather, gather Bluetooth data that is not private? You're, you, it seems like it's a trust issue then. So if the device can do it, someone could use it for that. And unless you're gating it as a device, there's nothing to prevent, and then it's back to your trust issue. That's the question. It's not a look have sandbox. Yeah. yeah. If you don't. There's lots of ways to do that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the question. Meaning, if, if you're not partitioning it off at the hardware level, how do you rectify that with the governance issue? So, uh, okay, so I think I'm starting to answer or uh, understand your question. Um, at a certain level, there's an agreement that we have to have with people who are allowed to put software on these devices and do experiments. Um, and it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of this high, maybe hypothetical is not quite the right word. It's kind of one of these situations where until you actually do it, you're not really quite sure how big of a problem it's going to be, right? So I've been in lots of projects where people said, no, no, we can't have an open wiki because people will put graffiti on it. It turned out nobody did that, right? OK, one or two people did it, and then you, you took it off, right? And they didn't come back. So it may be that um, nobody would even think to you know, collect Bluetooth addresses and try to you know, track their former girlfriend through the city or something like that. Um, but we want to review the code that's out there to make sure that that's not happening. Whether somebody is clever enough to break into the system and do stuff, well, that's the danger that we have with all, all systems. So there's an internal debate that we're having technically as well, right, which is should this machine here be the only one that talks to the internet? Should it watch all the bytes that come off of these or not. So we're, we're sort of having that debate, and, it's, and it's, until we put it out there, it's not, we don't know, uh, you know how many belts and suspenders we will, we will need. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys very much. This is